It's all right. So w warmest greetings from cold storage. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Leo Kretzenbacher, uh, as, as it was, was just introduced, and it's my great honor and pleasure to shortly introduce Dr. Agnese Bressin. Uh, we are celebrating the launch of Agnese's first monograph today. Uh, but of course, this is, uh, this is uh, far from her first experience in publishing her research. Since, since her time as a PhD candidate, Anita has published conference papers, journal articles in such prestigious journals as the Journal of Pragmatics and book chapters in edited volumes published by such renowned publishing houses as John Benjamins and Routledge. And while the book we're celebrating today is thematically situated in the Pragmatics of Address Research and has the distinction of being the second volume in the John Benjamin's rather new series, Topics in Address Research. Um, and I just got the program today of the, of the Bergamo Conference, and Anita will, uh, in our Address Research uh, circle, will, will give another paper there. Uh, Anita's fields of, of research also include the rich variety of dialects and languages in Italy, and I'm not going into that discussion whether they're dialects or languages. Uh, uh, linguistic practices of the Italian diaspora, and the participation of culturally and linguistically diverse populations in medical research. Not to mention that the languages Anita has done research on, that not everyone might know that, uh, include not only Italian and English, but also Czech and Slovak. Uh, John Hedrick and I were uh, lucky enough not only to supervise Anita's brilliant PhD thesis together, but also to co-author co some of the titles on Anita's impressive list of publications with, with her. Somehow, while doing a PhD and starting an academic career, Anita also found the time to successfully navigate Australia's notoriously difficult immigration bureaucracy <laughs> and, and start a family. So I don't want to take too much uh, time away from Anita's presentation of the research published in her book and our celebration. So without any further ado, the floor is yours, Anita. Thank Okay, uh, do I need to share the screen? You yeah. need to share the screen. Sorry. <laughs> I'm too excited. Uh, share screen. Yeah. Yeah? Should work now. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, can I close this or minimize? Put it up here. That should work. Yeah? Okay, cool. So, thank you very much, Leo, for the very generous introduction. So, yeah, finally my book has come out. <laughs> the title is Address Variation in Socio-Cultural Context, Region, Power and Distance in Italian Service Encounters. So here I was meant to have the flyer of the book, <laughs> it didn't come up, but there are copies on that table and you can see the book on the table as well. You can go through if you want to. Um, so um, I'm just going to go through the title and that will give me the chance to highlight the key um, uh, concepts of this book. So address. Um, since uh, Brown and Gilman's seminar uh, paper in 1960, we know that the way we address one another is very significant in terms of um, how we position uh, towards the others. So how we represent our identity, how we perceive our interlocutor's identity, and how we feel about the relationship uh, between the two. Uh, in many languages, um, there are different address pronouns that you can choose uh, to address a person, uh, for example, uh, in Spanish we have tu and usted, or in German we have du and easy. Um, so they signal, and they usually um, um, described as formal or informal address. Obviously, there's a lot more to it than formality, but just to make yourself understood. Uh, in Italian, we have um, a system of singular address pronouns that has two or three <laughs> different forms depending on where you're from. Uh, so we have two, which is the second person singular, is the informal way of addressing a person. Mm, then we 
have Roy, which is the second person plural, and it's um, described as a formal way, or definitely more formal than to, or not suitable for very close relationships. And it used to be uh, very widespread all over Italy in the past century, and it is still used today in some regions. But the standard B form in Italian, so formal address pronoun in Italian, is lei. Lei is the third person uh, singular feminine. Um, in the uh, geographical areas where voi is present, we have a system of three different pronouns. In most of the other regions and in standard Italian, we have only two uh, pronouns, tu and le. So it's quite complex, <laughs> you can see already. Uh, now, there are many factors for variation of address. In my book, I focused on three main ones, age, formality, and region. So age is quite universally accepted as a factor for variation in address uh, because we usually tend to show respect to older people, um, especially the ones we don't know, by address them uh, formally. And the formality, um, I'll, I'll say more about this when I talk about the sociocultural context, but uh, in general, we know that formality influence the address pronouns that we use. For example, if we think about a context like a courtroom or at work, we tend to be more formal with our interlocutors than uh, when we're in the family or with friends. And the region is one of the key aspects of uh, the book. And I will tell more when we go through the social cultural content. So Italian regions. Um, it, the linguistic background of Italy is quite um, complex and articulate. Uh, we have lots of local languages. Um, sometimes they're called Italian dialects, or most of them uh, can be called Italian dialects, but they're better understood as local languages. So they are languages derived from Latin, uh, parallel to Italian, so not derived from Italian. And um, in many regions, a lot of speakers speak a local language as well as a regional variety of Italian. Um, this is linked to the fact that Italian regions have a very strong cultural and political history. So there were um, Ita many Italian regions were separated in history and they developed their own uh, political history. And, and that's why the local languages also developed independently or relatively independently. Um, all of this um, contributes to um, marked regional identities. So we have different languages, different traditions, even different climate and different local produce and different culinary traditions. So they all contribute to marked regional identities in Italy. Um, there are also cultural models and stereotypes associated with uh, Italian regions. Uh, one of the most common one is the um, north-south dichotomy. So there are um, stereotypes associated with the macro region of Northern Italy and Southern Italy. Uh, not that this is something that I want to <laughs> favor or facilitate, but um, <coughs> just to talk about the positive side, the Northern is usually represented, the North, sorry, of Italy is usually represented as uh, more economically dynamic and people are hard working. And the South is usually depicted and more authentic. And then we have Rome, which in some respect has some of the characteristics of the Southern uh, cultural model. Um, but on top of that, we also have um, a quite uh, distinct, um, you know, very long history, obviously, and um, cynicism and also uh, humor. Uh, and the language variety of Rome is also quite well known, also due to its um, 
large presence in, uh, in the cinema and in the television. Um, so that was the Italian region. Now, if we look at the other aspect of the sociocultural context, uh, uh, this is restaurant encounters. So this is the situational context that I chose for my investigation. Uh, what are restaurant encounters? They are part of uh, a type of service encounters. Uh, in particular, I focus on the relationship between customers and waiters. And in my analysis, I found that the power relations between customers and waiters are quite complex. And um, so on the one hand, we have the traditional customer is always right sort of approach. But on the other hand, I found that the waiter also have, has some sort of power in the relationship, especially if they, if the waiter is um, also the manager of the restaurant. So in the Italian context, uh, waiters, so the people who serve, attend the service at the tables can be, um, can have um, a variety of roles in, in the, business, it could be a simple junior waiter or it could be the manager who also serves the team. So I found that the waiter also has a power in the relationship um, because they act as the hosts. So they have the power to set sort of the house rules of the place um, in terms of what is expected and what is allowed. Um, I differentiated this um, situational context into three different levels, um, low end, from low end restaurants to high end restaurants. Um, and that's just, and that re does refer to the formality of the context. So a refined restaurant will have a higher level of formality than a modest restaurant and all in between. Um, this factor also influenced the use of humor and dialect in the language practices. Now, before I go to the screen, I'm going to have a drink of water, excuse me. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, I found that this study is uh, significant, um, at least for these three main points. Uh, restaurant encounters, so the focus on this particular situation in context. The introduction of Italian into the field of regional formatic variation, and also the conceptualization of Italian regions as community of practice. Now, the first one, why is it significant? It's because this is a novel situational context that to my knowledge has uh, never been analyzed linguistically before. And Italian service encounters in general are under investigated. So this study contributes um, to uh, discover something about Italian service encounters and the language practices that occur in them. And the second point, the introduction of Italian to the field of um, regional chromatic variation. So I spoke about Italian regions before so in each region, I said that often, or at least traditional, there is a local language as well as a regional variety of Italian. Regional varieties of Italian uh, have been um, an area of research that has been quite popular in, in, you know, for decades in Italian linguistics and dialectology. However, it has mostly focused on lexical aspects and phonetic aspects some morphosyntactic aspects, but not much on the pragmatic aspects. And as Schneider and Placencia also pointed out in 2017, um, pragmatics have has hope, sorry, often been neglected in the study of regional variation and Italian is no exception in this respect. So my study contributes also to the description of uh, regional varieties of Italian in their pragmatic aspects. And the last one is the conceptualization of regions as communities of practice. So, this is a long one. 
to explain, but I'll try, I'll do my best. And I'm happy to answer questions later. So, uh, probably most of us are familiar with the concept of community of practice, uh, especially in the way it was developed and used by ECID. Um, however, in the conceptualization of ECID, um, the, um, the language and identity have a very strong link. However, uh, the, the common endeavor of the members of the community of practice is one of the key aspects of this concept of community of practice. In my study, on the other hand, I anchored the concept of community of practice with a strong relationship between language and identity to uh, a different concept of identity, uh, so a sociocultural model of identity, which is more flexible. In this concept of identity, agency is not seen as necessarily deliberate, but agency basically comprises all of the actions that an individual does. Habitual, conscious, no matter how aware an individual is, all the practices will contribute to their identity and to their belonging to a particular community of practice. So the way I speak, no matter how conscious I am, will tell something about my identity. Um, when we anchor the concept of community of practice to this con flexible concept of identity, then the community of practice um, is liberated by this obligation to have the common endeavor. And then we can use it to um, interpret all of our language practices in terms of our identity, no matter how conscious, no matter how deliberate. Um, and this proved very useful and suitable for my study. Um, so in this model of identity, we have three levels. Demographic, cultural, linguistic, and uh, situational interaction. In my study, I monitored the demographic level, especially um, gender and age. Uh, not so much the educational level, because it turns out that most of my participants were quite highly educated, so it wasn't suitable to study that sort of variation. And um, the situa situational and interactional level is um, restaurant encounters. So I kept that factor stable or constant, while be differentiating with different levels of restaurant, so that the major factor for variation that I investigated is the cultural and linguistic levels, that is the Italian regions. Um, so thanks to the theoretical model and the methodology that goes with it, then I was able to conclude that address practices, and in particular the use of two lay and boring in restaurant encounters, um, contribute to the perception of regional identities. So the frequency and the meaning that are associated with the use of two lay and boy in restaurant encounters um, are perceived as meaningful in terms of representing a regional identity. And this is it. This is my references. Thank you very much. Right. Okay. So um, should we perhaps do you want do you want to um, unshare the screen? Yes. Yes. Stop share. Okay, so we certainly have plenty of time for um, discussion and questions. And sorry to interrupt. We also have some nibbles and some drinks afterwards. Okay, we do have some nibbles and some drinks afterwards. But those of you who are joining us on Zoom may have some may have some difficulty involving in that unless you can personally get here quickly because um, it'll all be gone if you're coming from very far away. Um, so if we're going to have some questions, 
those of you who are talking from within the room might like to come forward and ask the question here or make your point here so that all the people who are watching by Zoom can hear it. Um, those of you who are speaking by Zoom, we haven't tested whether we'll hear you, but you can put the question into the chat and we can then read it out if we can't hear you. So who would like to commence the discussion? John. Sorry, I mean, I, I understand that the major function, the purpose of today is the actual formal book launch, but I wonder if you could just give us a brief overview of your major findings yeah. in terms of the program. Yeah, sure. I have a few slides on this one, so I'll go back to the presentation. But, oh, of course, thank you very much. Share this one. Okay. Hello. It will come, hopefully. Oh, here we go. So oh. that's the background, methodology, research question here. Cool. Findings. Hello. Okay, cool. Uh, so the main finding, as I said, uh, regional variation is the main topic of the book. So I can show you what the findings of regional variation are. In my study, I found um, both quantitative and qualitative differences in the ways um, or, and in the frequencies in which two, sorry? Yeah. Ah, that's a good point. Thank you. Oh, oh. Ah. <laughs> no, that's okay. It shouldn't be too hard. Yeah, I want this one. Okay, cool. Thank you. That, that was a good point. Um, so, quantitative and qualitative differences. In terms of qualitative difference, differences, this is um, a chart that shows. Um, the percentages of respondents in each region uh, who uh, reported frequently using each of the pronouns. And by frequently, I always combine these two answers. So as we can see in all regions, lay, so the green column is the highest, uh, followed by two, the blue column, and then voy is the shortest one. So overall, there are some consistencies that lay is the most commonly reportedly used uh, pronoun, followed by two and then only marginal use of boy. However, there are significant differences as well. For example, can I go there even if the Zoom people I'm, want to? I'm that? not sure how well we're going to be able to hear uh, it. Ah, oh, that's a good point. Okay, I'll stay here then. And I will point, point. <laughs> point to the screen. So, if we look at Salento, the red column is higher in there than in other regions. So that signal that uh, boy in Salento is not a major pronoun, but it's still used more than in the other regions. And this is probably due to the fact that Salento belongs to Southern Italy, which is a macro region uh, where we still use some boy. And tentatively we can, um, attribute this to the influence of Naples in these micro regions. Also the, one of the most important cities in that micro region. Uh, also, if we look at the green columns, we can say that that's very high in Sardinia, more than in the other regions. Uh, so that, that was associated to a preference for formality in Sardinia. Uh, more than in the other regions investigated. And the use of two is particularly high in Lazio. Uh, so this is the frequency of, um, the frequency with which the customers reported being addressed by the waiters. So it looks like in Lazio is more common than in other regions to be addressed with two when you go to restaurants. 
something that would be considered root in other regions, uh, but not so much in, in Lazio and particularly in Rome. So that's one. And the other one is the frequency with which the um, uh, respondents reported addressing the waiters with the three pronouns. Uh, so here again, lay is the most common in all the regions, uh, followed by two, and then only marginal use of boy in all regions. But again, we see a little bit more boy direct column in Salento compared to other ones. And some regions having a, a more marked preference for lay, uh, so the green column than in the other regions. And in this case, we see that Umbria has the highest column, uh, the blue one, for the use of two. So um, this was a particularly interesting uh, finding. And um, we don't know if a, highest, a higher use of two uh, by the customers to the waiters is linked to a more traditional uh, vision of power relationships between the customer and the waiters. So the customer is always right kind of um, concept. Um, so we would need further investigations for this. But we have qualitative data that also tell us more about uh, these differences that we find in the quantitative. So I don't want to take too much time on this, but we have um, some comments that uh, indicate the preference for distance in Sardinia. So this respondent was criticizing the use of ciao, so an informal greeting, together with the use of tu in Rome and Milan. So have, as a Sardinian, he prefers lei, so the use of more distance in this relationship, so between the customers and the waiters. In Lazio, I mentioned the use of tu by waiters. So um, many Romans would see this, that this as a positive sign that the relationship is um, harmonious, but for some people from other regions, this might be considered rude, for example, Sardinia. In Salento, we did see some use of boy and particularly there was a waitress that I interviewed that said that boy was her preference, a preferred pronoun to use. Uh, whereas other people said that no, boy is never used. So the contradicting um, opinions or perceptions about the use of boy in this region. I should mention that um, if more regions were included in the study, especially Naples or Calabria, we am sure that we would have seen a much higher use of boy. Because in those regions, boy is definitely um, a very important pronoun and is that would definitely be used to show respect, but to avoid distance. So that would definitely be, um, we would have different findings in that way. In Emilia, we saw the importance of youthfulness. So there was quite a high use of two in Emilia and this has been associated to the importance of the concept of uh, youthfulness. And in particular, there was a waiter <laughs> in his 50s. <laughs> he, yeah, he thought that it was, he, he was somehow offended by when he was addressed with lay that made him feel old. Uh, in Umbria, we saw uh, quite a large use of two by the customers. And I did mention that tentatively there could be an association with a traditional vision of power. But also we need to remember that there's uh, quite a lot of transition from uh, a non-reciprocal use of tu and lei, so formal and informal between the customer and the waiter. So the customer being in a higher position than um, the waiter, but then this could transition quite quickly to a mutual tool. So obviously surveys have lots of limitations in the terms of data that they can uh, produce. And, and one is the fact that the, the um, 
language practices uh, and the relationships between people that are quite dynamic, they don't need to just stick to whatever they start with. And yes, this is the, uh, what's the, um, the findings of regional variation. Thank you for the question. Thanks. Well, there's been a lot of action on the, um, the don't go away. Ah. There's um, been a lot of action on the chat front while you've been. Okay. You want to bring up the chat and yes. <clears throat> go back up to the top. Oh, how long uh, have we got? So okay. if we start from here. here. Yes. This is so true. My father's from Lazio, my mother from Sardinia. They use address stamps. It's very different. Yes, there is a lot of um, perception of these differences. It's not just linguists <laughs> that get excited with this sort of stuff. And also regional variation is a very common topic for Italians. Oh, you're Italian, where are you from? Suddenly, you know, immediately we wanna know the region. Interesting, Giuseppe, my mom used to address her mother-in-law with boy, yes. I wonder where they were from. Because, and the use of boy in the family actually has been identified as quite common, uh, even outside Southern Italy. One new message, is that Luigi? Sardinia. Okay, I'll get to that. Cool. Um, my grand, yeah. my my mother used to. Oh, oh Luigi can speak. Yeah. Thank Luigi you. Luigi can tell you where she's from. <laughs> oh yeah, they're both both oh, my mom oh, and uh, yeah. my yeah. grandmother right. are from yeah. northern yeah. Italy. My volume. Yeah. Can you hear me? Ah, do you want to come and do that, friends? Sorry, just Sorry. one second. I'm not a PC user, so. So. It's too complicated. There's so much technology. I can type. I'm not a PC user, so I don't know. Oh, no, wait, actually, it's in Zoom. It's in Zoom mode, you can't. Yeah. So it's easier if Luigi can ask. Yeah, no, Luigi can ask. <laughs> yes, Luigi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's going to type. Okay, okay so. cool. Yes. From Brescia. Ah, okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. So I was saying that um, the use of boy within the family, especially to all the generations, has been identified as quite frequent, um, even outside the, um, the macro region of southern Italy, um, and um, and especially in the past decades. So maybe now not very very common, but definitely someone who is an adult now could recall that the use of boy in their family. Um, oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, just stop. Oops. No. no but that's all right. Yeah. Right. No. Where is it? That's all right. I should work anywhere. The, the battery. It, oh, it's work. the battery. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, just on this topic, I just uh, found it interesting what, what Luigi was saying, because in my young family, and my grandmother is from Istria, yeah. <laughs> She actually used the boy to address her father mm. and the lay to address her mother because oh. she was more distant, like there was more respect due to the father and a more intimate relationship with her mother. The lay is more intimate. Intimate, than... yeah, with, with the mother. So it, it was interesting within the four, the four, uh, there were four siblings. My, my grandmother was born in 1922. She was the second, so there was an older one. So she would use the boy for father and lay for the mother. And her younger, she had two younger, one brother and sister. They would both use lay for both parents. Whereas the oldest brother would use boy for both parents. <laughs> so it was a... 
Thank you, Gregoria. This is quite a good example of, of how complex it might be to navigate the system of address pronouns in Italian. And also, I found it interesting that lei was interpreted as more um, close, as the closer. As a, a comparative before. Yeah. Yes. So that's um, one interpretation. But for example, in the regions where voi is still currently used, then voi is not as distant as lei. So if if there's a scale, it will be two for closest, void for respectful, but still someone that you know quite well, and then lay distant for someone you don't know. But obviously um, the interpretation that Gregoria gave from her family uh, was different. So quite a complex, yeah. So if you want to just go back and deal with, just go up the um, chat, chat and yeah. yeah. there's still, yeah, so the, the one from David Vetterding is the first um, substantial. We just, we just have to read it, maybe. Okay. That's it. You suggested. Okay, most in Salento because it is southern there. Is in Sardinia also southern? Why does going not occur often in Sardinia? Mm -hmm. Now there's an answer to that. Yeah. <laughs> Sardinia cannot be considered part of the South given the multiple cultural, linguistic, and historical differences that distinguish it from other Southern regions. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> so it is very complex. Um, so let's say that even, uh, yeah, no. Um, even if we consider Southern Italy without Sardinia, um, the cultural and political, the political history of southern Italy is quite compact compared to northern Italy, where we had lots of different states and city states. The south was kind of um, mostly belonging to the same state under different foreign ruling, but usually it belonged to a compact state. Even there, we have quite significant differences. So, for example, as we saw in Salento, the use of voi is quite limited and um, it's very uh, contradicting. So the opinions that people have on the use of voi, whereas if you go to Naples, that most people will um, agree that that's how you use voi to show respect to someone you're quite familiar with, but not too close to. So with that example, I just want to um, highlight the fact that the linguistic practices in Italy, um, including the use of address pronouns, they vary really significantly. And you might go to a village and find that in the next village, they have completely different practices there, and they might argue with each other on those. Um, and Sardinia in particular has a very uh, complex history as well. Um, also, we need. I in my study, I considered local languages and the systems of address pronouns in the local languages. So, some local languages traditionally only have two or the equivalent of two. So, uh, and that might influence the language practices in that region variety of Italian towards a wider use of two. And the regions in which local languages have a third person pronoun used as an address pronoun, uh, they might be, they might have a higher use of lay as a sort of equivalent or like a transfer from the local language to the regional variety of Italian. And Sardinia is one of the regions in which the local languages do have this third personal pronoun. So that might facilitate a, most, a more widespread use of lay in those regions as opposed to Salento, which traditionally only has two or signoria, but used with two verbs. I hope I didn't make that even more confusing. Um, Maria's question. Sorry, where is it? Uh, yeah, yeah. Fine. When I was learning in China, I was told that voice sounded like you had just come from the village. Educated people use lay. Is that no longer true? I would say it's no longer true because First of all, we, um, I think we might, there, there would be still obviously a variation between uh, rural and um, urban varieties in each region. But I wouldn't say that Voi is more rural nowadays 
because, okay, maybe a few decades ago when voy was still used all over Italy and then gradually was disappearing, maybe the residual uses might have uh, been um, more evident in the rural areas. But nowadays, I think it's too far gone in the past. Um, so I think it's more of a, a regional difference. So at, I mentioned Ma Naples many times, so that's a city and the urban variety of uh, Italian in there, they will definitely use boy. Three more messages. I think some discussion with Laura. They use boy in dialect, yes, so sometimes. <laughs> It, that can be the case. I had waited to talk to a group of customers with Loro. Ah, oh, thank you. This is, I use Loro for the customers. Huh? This is a very good point. Thank you very much, uh, Luigi. I'm actually going to present uh, my results on Loro at the um, conference that Leo was talking about. So in a conference in Bergamo uh, next month. And that is uh, definitely the case. And um, that concerns the plural address. So in my study or what I presented in the book and today I focused on singular address pronouns. If we look at the uh, plural, uh, voi is the most commonly used one. And then we have loro, which is the third person plural. And we have residual use of this form, which is considered quite formal but restaurants are one of the um, key domains where loro can be used, if especially in some form like formulas like um, desidero no or sia comodi no. So that, that will be further investigated. Now, mindful of the fact that we do still have the formal book launching to have, you want to, you had a question? I know that, I know that. Um, as, as, <laughs> As, as so frequently happens during these talks, once the discussion gets going, the questions get more and more, but we do have a formal book launch to do. So why don't we do that now? Um, the questions that are in the, um, in the chat can perhaps come back again. So how are we doing the book launch? I'm, I'm happy to do it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask you my question. I don't know how long my book, I don't do it. I tell you that they use extremely heavy paper. It's uh, it's it's a uh, um, it's very important time. It's, it's, uh, honestly, it's a, it's a great pleasure and honour to be here today and to have been. Uh, we Leo and I certainly consider ourselves to have been privileged enough to be a little part of uh, Agnes's journey, and we're delighted to see the the full publication of her, the original dissertation. This really is novel and groundbreaking. Uh, this is really, there is very little uh, research done on service encounters really in any aspect in Italy. And the stuff that there is, is, is basically from the 1980s and nothing to do with this, this kind of thing. It's amazing no one thought, of, thought to do this before given the importance of food culture in the Italian context. Uh, and I think this book is actually gonna be a really great um, success. So my congratulations to Agnese to seeing it through to publication. I know that the reviewers' comments, both in the, the PhD, but also in the book review were fantastic as well. So congratulations to Agnese. And um, um, here is what it looks like. I'm, it's very beautifully designed as well. So there you go. So thank you. Thank you. Ask you a few more things on that. Uh, what? Do you to, or do you want to? Do you want to ask your question? Yeah. We've got another nine minutes. Uh, so I had a question, Anya, about well, a couple of prongs to it. Uh, was it all self-reported? Um, so you asked people, you didn't record interactions in noisy restaurants. You asked them what they use in encounters, and is that correct? Yeah, was not, I come yeah. Yeah. Comments maybe be safe. Um, most of the data uh, is reported data, uh, but I did do some uh, observations, so no recording, but I unfortunately had to go to a few restaurants <laughs> and observe um, the language practices, both at my table as well as the neighbouring tables. 
and that is a small part of the data collection, but um, it did shed light on some very important uh, aspects of language use. For example, the avoidance strategy. Mm -hmm. So when, especially waiters, they were not sure what to use, they would avoid addressing altogether. So they will use maybe the first person or impersonal forms um, so that they didn't have to make a choice. <coughs> and also hesitation and uh, alternation. Mm. So using a little bit of lay, a little bit of two. Mm -hmm. I, I do that too. It's embarrassing <laughs> to admit it somehow, but it is quite mm -hmm. common because uh, if you want to be formal, but you kind of feel somehow close to that person or, you know, there's mm -hmm. all sorts of different factors playing simultaneously. So the alternation is quite a, a common phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Yes. And to, to follow up, um, do you have other studies in mind, like um, more regions or lurking outside restaurants and asking people straight after an encounter what they've used or anything like that to to expand on this work? Uh, my dream is to cover all the regions of Italy <laughs> because a geographical comprehensive account of uh, the use of address pronouns in Italy is lacking, is not there. So the last account we have is a publication by Rolls in 1960 uh, and the data comes from uh, the 1920s and 30s. So an update is long overdue. And yes, my dream is to create a map of Italy in which we can see um, how much to lay and voi are used uh, in each of the region. Obviously, you know, that's my dream. <laughs> Hopefully, maybe my postdoc project or uh, some um, future research project will uh, have this um, goal, yeah. Okay, nibbles and drink. Are we ready? <laughs> and thank you very much, Leo and John, for supervising me during uh, my project. It was a pri the privilege was all mine, really. <laughs> I've been very lucky, and I'll be forever thankful um, for the great job that you both did. Thank you very much. You can close this. I, I think there are still a few points in the chat that we didn't manage to get to deal with, but um, perhaps we will um, call it an end here. Those of you who want to discuss the matter further with Agnese can, of course, contact her directly. And, uh, of course, get the book, which, for those of you who are not here, I did put the link up earlier but again if you haven't got it um, we can provide it so apologies that we can't invite all of you to join in the food and drink that has been provided here but those who are in the room we could now go through to the tea room where it's a tiny bit warmer and enjoy something there so thanks to everyone and thanks again to Anis.